Good afternoon. Uh, I'm David Powers, and I'm the director of the Medieval Studies Program. And uh, um, I, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming in from the brilliant sunshine on the Arts Quad down to the basement of Rare Books and Manuscripts for today's talk uh, by Laurent Ferry. Um, Laurent is a, a former student at the École de Chartres and the École de Patrimoine. Uh, he wrote a dissertation that was supervised by Michel Pastoreau, who is an historian of colors and also a pioneer of animal studies. From 2000 to 2005, Laurent was conservateur de patrimoine, or was a curator at the French National Archives, and he also taught at the École Nationale d'Administration in Rabat, Morocco, and at the École Nationale de Deschartes in Paris. In 2006, Laurent came to Cornell, uh, where he wears several hats, in addition to beautiful ties. And uh, I think there may be a connection between the ties and the talk, but that remains to be determined. He is adjunct associate professor of comparative literature, a member of the graduate field in medieval studies, and most importantly, I guess, for today's talk, curator of the pre-1800 collections in the Division of Rare uh, and Manuscript Collections, the RMC. Laurent has published numerous articles and also a collection of texts entitled Il raconte la mondialisation de Sénèque à Lévi-Strauss uh, in 2005. Uh, I really want to thank Laurent because he uh, volunteered this talk for the Medieval Studies Program, which I'm the director of, and, and hopefully this will be the first in, of several uh, presentations on medieval manuscripts. Uh, later in the semester, we may have, we'll have a talk by uh, Ali Huisa on Arabic manuscripts, Islamic manuscripts, and then next semester we hope to have talks on Indic manuscripts, uh, medieval manuscripts, so we hope to see many of you at those events as well. The title of today's presentation is The Proud Symbolism of Heraldry, Why It Matters, and Why It Is Fun. Laurent. Ah, and we all turn into pumpkins at 6 o'clock. So we have to be out of here at 6 o'clock. Laurent plans to speak for an hour, and then there will be time for questions and answers. Laurent, how are you? Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, dear David, for uh, the gracious invitation and your generous words of introduction. Uh, the lecture I'm about to deliver is a much improved version of a talk commissioned by Andy Galloway, David's predecessor, in 2010. The title by then was Heraldry is Sexy, and I think it revealed some anxiety about the perception of European medieval heraldry. It is often but wrongly regarded as esoteric science and something for the snobs, especially uh, with me as the speaker. To properly describe our blason arms, one has to use an arcane terminology codified and refined to a fault by heralds and scholars over the centuries. To make things worse, in English-speaking countries, the language of heraldry is normally still Norman French, the language habitually spoken at the court of England in the early heraldic age. Another reason for the relative discredit of heraldry is that being a noble and bearing arms are, are too often seen as synonymous, which of course raises suspicion in our democratic societies. In fact, especially after the 14th century, the use of armorial bearings was almost never restricted to certain individuals, families, corporations, or institutions. Clearly, there was a difference between England, where heraldry was mostly for aristocrats, and Italy, where heraldry was everywhere and pretty much for everyone. There is a very amusing anecdote in that respect in Vasari's Lives of the Artists about the painter Giotto. And I'm just going to uh, quote a short excerpt. A rough workman, un grossolano artifice, hearing of his fame, came to Giotto's workshop, followed, someone, followed by someone carrying his shield. He found him and said, Master, I want you to paint my arms on this shield. Giotto, 
considering the man in his manner of speech said nothing but, when do you want it? And he told him. Giotto said, leave me to do it. So the man went away, and Giotto left alone said to himself, what did he mean? Is this a joke? I never had a shield to paint before, and this man is a simple fellow, and bade me paint his arms as if he were of the royal house of France. So considering the matter, he put the shield before him and made a design with a helmet, a pair of iron gloves, a cuirass, a sword, a dagger, and a lance, and asked one of his pupils to paint it. The almost universal right to assume and display insignia or coats of arms was something most medieval jurists agreed upon. In 1355, Bartolo Sassoferrato, a famous professor of Roman law at Perugia, wrote in his Tractatus de Insignis et Armis, Arma autem quidam et insignia sibi assumunt propria autoritate et istis an liceat videnum est et puto quod licet. Some coats of arms belong to private persons, either nobles or commoners, and some of them bear such insignia by the grant of an emperor or another lord. Some assume coat of arms, coats of arms on their own initiative, and we should consider whether they are permitted to do it. I think they are permitted. And he goes on. Just as names are created to identify persons, so insignia and coats of arms are devised for this purpose. Anyone is permitted to use such names for oneself, and thus anyone can bear them and depict them on his own belongings, but not on another's belongings. A century uh, later, Nicholas Upton denied in his De Studio Militari that the kings of England were the only ones to uh, be able to confer arms to nobles only. Now, it is certainly true that arms were used more frequently or prominently by aristocracy, which led to mass destruction when feudal systems or titles of nobility were abolished much later uh, in the 18th century. But you can find many traces of commoners uh, using arms everywhere in Europe. In fact, this is only in the USA uh, that uh, personal arms have been, uh, at least until the appropriation uh, of heraldry by the hip hop movement and the vogue of heraldic tattoos inspired by Game of Thrones. Uh, the, the, it was uh, before that the quasi monopoly of the nouveau super rich, uh, money men seeking status like Donald Trump who uh, I had to, uh, of course, to mention Donald Trump is everywhere, uh, and uh, who couldn't resist uh, to uh, create his own arms, just forgot to register them in Scotland, which got him into trouble. And here is, uh, this is the, uh, oh, where is it now? Uh, I, I had a tie uh, by Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, someone stole it already. Uh, no, it's over there. <laughs> Uh, this is the only item I'm going to circulate uh, today for the uh, other materials you will have to, to come uh, closer at the end of my, my talk. And this is very typical of American heraldry, but uh, this is a very different story that I'm going to, to tell you. Uh, anyway, the title today is uh, The Proud of, of Heraldry. This is an expression I found in a book by Jules Michelet, Why It Matters, Why It Is Fun. It is a general introduction inspired by, uh, largely by the writings of my master, Michel Pastoureau, and based on our collections, our magnificent collections, and with some personal hypotheses. First, I would speak about the origins and raison d'etre of heraldry, arms which were origin originally individual emblems of individual knights became hereditary from the end of the 12th century and were passed down through the same family, but heraldry was also created for guilds, cities, states, to serve different social and political purposes. We can still use the definition proposed by Otto von Effner in uh, 1861. Wappen sind nach bestimmten Grundsätzen und Regeln der Wissenschaft und Kunst entworfene Bilder, deren Führung und Gebrauch ein gutes Recht für sich hat oder beansprucht. Coats of arms are images designed according to predefined scholarly and aesthetic principles and rules and whose control and use entitle their owner to certain rights or claims. But this is a very incomplete definition. Uh, I guess we can criticize him now. Uh, uh, and I will show in my second part that arms also became a merely convenient referencing system used, for instance, in cartography or pharmacopoeia. And that fictional heraldry uh, was meant to serve another purpose to enchant uh, and entertain in travel books and poetry. In my third and last part, I will recapitulate why 
heraldry matters for students and scholars nowadays. So let's start with the origins of heraldry. From the end of the Middle Ages, heralds and historians put forward several hypotheses to try and explain the origins of heraldry. Some fanciful traditions attributed that invention to Adam, the first man, or Julius Caesar. Their fable Wappen, fictional coats of arms, were especially popular in Germany. Number one on this table is a leaf from Ulrich von Richenthal's book Das Concilium Geschehen zu Constanz, uh, printed in 1483. Richenthal was a rich merchant who documented the Council of Constance, which ended the papal schism, as well as the pageants surrounding this huge event attended by more than 70,000 visitors over four years, which was a considerable number for the time. Uh, this book contains woodcuts depicting hundreds of coats of arms, including some claimed to be the three oldest heraldic devices ever, the Ersten Drei Wappen in der Welt, those of Abishai, King David's nephew, Sabitai, one of his generals, and Bananias, sounds like Woody Allen, or Bananyahu, commander of Solomon's army in the Old Testament. But also, of course, these arms never existed. They were just a pure invention. Rishenthal also included in his book a three different legendary coats of arms attributed to Julius Caesar. But they were wrong. Another hypothesis that was widely discussed in the late 19th century was that ancient Greeks invented heraldry, among other things. It is true that Greek armies use different codes of color and that the combatants shown on Greek vases sometimes bear round shields representing animal figures, eagles, lions, griffins, and of course, the sacred hall of Athens that more or less resembled those on medieval arms. Some were reproduced by neoclassical artists like John Flaxman, uh, but uh, uh, these occasional decorative symbols are not genuine armorial shields because one, they are not constantly used by the same person. The same individual in Greece, the same warrior, is represented in several places or moments bearing different arms. Even though, and this is a troubling fact brought to my attention by Laurent Dubreuil, Euripides in his tragedy, The Phoenician Women, line 1107, describes a warrior whose shield bears Epicemon Oikeion, the heraldic emblem of his house. But this is the only mention of the arms of an entire family, of an entire clan, uh, as far as we know in whole Greek literature. The very, B, the, C, the very simple composition does not obey fixed and recurrent conventions the way heraldry does. And I'm going to speak uh, a bit more about the conventions of heraldry. Third, many devices were invented by the potter or the costume designers for the stage, and these craftsmen were unconcerned with real arms, arms in real life. If we move in time, we find representations of Byzantine soldiers harboring different colors and devices, but they are doubtful and nothing is systematic there. In fact, heraldry was never adopted in the Byzantine Empire. Seals are completely different, etc. So it's not uh, a Byzantine uh, invention either. Most heraldists uh, today agree that the earliest documented arms were those of Geoffrey Plantagenet, Count of Anjou and Duke of Normandy, who died in 1151. On this enamel funeral plaque, formerly in Le Mans Cathedral, is shown holding a huge azure, azure shield strewn with golden lions. A chronicler of Anjou tells that on his marriage in 1127, Geoffrey received from his father-in-law, Henry I, a shield strewn with such lions. Unfortunately, this text was written uh, in 1175, 20 years after Geoffrey's death, and the plague was created around 1160 at the request of his widow, Matilda. So Geoffrey probably never bore arms, and his only surviving a seal shows no armory. Moreover, in the words of Pastoureau, and I quote, the quest for the oldest extant arms is a rather futile exercise. The appearance of arms is not due to any individual initiative but was a social phenomenon that took place over a fairly long period of time between approximately 1120 and 1150. Indeed, we know that during this period, a number of Jeffrey's contemporaries were showing Amoyo's bearings on their own seals as well as their shield. This is in the Western European wars of the Middle Ages that we must seek the military and paramilitary reasons for the appearance of Amoyo shields and holder in general. Warriors faced a serious problem. There were more and more combatants on the battlefield, and they were less and less recognizable because of the coat of mail and the nose piece nasal of the helmet, which covered their face. 
A good example of the problem arising on many battlefields is provided by the first comic strip in history, the Bayeux Tapestry, which, as you know, tells the conquest of England by the Norman Duke Guillaume or William the Conqueror around 1080, that is, two generations before the appearance of arms. This detail of the tapestry, uh, which is not a tapestry, this detail shows Duke William lifting his helmet to identify himself to his men after being unhorsed during the uh, slightly unhorsed uh, during the Battle of Hastings. Hey guys, it's me. I'm not dead. And you see the gesture. Mm -hmm. He has to show his face to his fellow combatants. To be identified, knights gradually adopted the custom of having devices depicted on their shield and clothes sewn onto their, their surcoat. This custom became established early and can be called proto-heraldry. In this relation of the Battle, battle of Brémule, which was fought on uh, August 11, 19, between Henry I of England and Louis VI, the Fat of France, the English monk and chronicler Ordericus Vitalis describes how Pierre de Maulle and other French knights threw away their field signs called cogniciones to avoid recognition. Petrus de Manlia, aliique non nulli fugientum, cogniciones suas ne agnosgerentur pro iecerunt. But most variety and codification was needed on the battlefield. Coats of arms became an essential tool of recognition, control, and command, both on the battlefields of Europe and during the Crusades. The Itinerarium Regis Ricardi, a Latin prose narrative of the Third Crusade, compiled in, in the 1220s, contains several mentions of arms. In the words of Andrew Ayton, and I quote, Captain's authority was symbolized in his heraldic identity, his status and his presence marked by his banner and the devices distributed to his men, his influence and the strength of his social relationships by the fact that some bore arms that were derived from their leaders. The downside of it, of course, is that prominent warriors became not only focal points for their men, but also easy targets for their enemy. Most of the time, they would be captured for ransom because... Uh, their enemies said, oh, look, this guy is a powerful one. We should uh, make him a prisoner. Uh, heralds were in charge of identifying and numbering both the prisoners and the dead after the battle, and they would often do it with the help of an armorial brought to the battlefield, such as this one, l'armorial Le Breton, composed in the 13th century and acquired by the French National Archives. We believe that this armorial was used after Azincourt just to identify the dead bodies on the, the battlefield because, you know, they were just in, uh, in many pieces. On the battlefield, uh, you find many non-knights who also uh, used heraldic devices. This is an example here. And in his great book, Bloodied Banners, Martial Display on Medieval Battlefields, Robert W. Jones reminds us of the Courtrai chest, this amazing object, uh, which depicts the Flemish victory over the French in 1302, the Battle of the Golden Spurs. And we see uh, the militia marching on the banners charged with the heraldic symbols of the various professional guilds associated with the image of their patron saints, the smiths, the masons, the wavers, etc. Th those are not nobles, knights, but they use heraldic devices uh, as well. The arms of their guilds, professional guilds, not their family. Uh, I don't really have the time to speak about the process of nationalization of heraldry on the battlefield that conflicts with the feudal uh, logic. I think there's a dual process after the 14th century. On the one hand, a process of armorial dissemination, uh, an expression I'm borrowing from Aiton, meaning that coats of arms are generalized and heralds are more and more creative. On the other hand, you have a process of armorial concentration more and more individual family arms, but this trend is at odds with the loi de contraction, the narrowing of the family structures, and also the fact that there's a growing authority of the state in society, including on the battlefield. In Europe, armies increasingly dominated by infantry and artillery in large-scale battles adopted the arms of the reigning family of this country, the family that funded the war. More often than in wars in which few real battles actually took place, but that would be a subject of another presentation, it was in tournaments 
fake wars that knights tended to use the unchanging and codified heraldic marks as means of identification. Historians such as Laurent Ablot uh, claim that heraldry was actually born during archaic form tournaments, not on the battlefield, and that it was more a product of sports and festivities than uh, the product of war. At any rate, tournaments remained until the mid-16th century the main forum for heraldic rituals. An indication of the importance of heraldry in tournaments is provided by a passage, a passage in Chrétien de Troyes' roman, roman Lancelot, written between 1176 and 1181, and studied by Mary Arlen Santina. Lancelot is imprisoned just before a great tournament is to begin. He obtains permission to leave jail for the duration of the tournament and to borrow equipment for, from his captor, whose wife is put in charge of the loan. Et la dame tantôt lui baille les armes de son seigneur Vermoille. Vermoille, that is red. As a result, when the herald comes to list the participants to the tournament, he cannot determine the shield's owner. Un hero d'armes les trouva s'il les garda, mais pour Esther qu'il connut lui ne son maître. Until he peeks through the open door of Lancelot's bedroom and sees him sleeping, the following day, Lancelot becomes known as Le Chevaliers Vermos, that is the Red Knight. In IMC, we are lucky to have a second edition of uh, the most beautiful of uh, all tournament, tournament books, Ursprung und Erkommen des Turniers in Deutsche Nation, the edition of 1532, uh, which describes the style, horsemanship, and rules of the tournaments of the 15th and 16th century, as well as a count of tournaments dating back to the 10th century. Included are depictions of tournaments, award ceremonies, balls, balls uh, banqueting, and other festivities. The almost 300 large and small woodcuts uh, in the book uh, show uh, the arms of the dukes hosting the event, those of the victors at the tournament, and those of the town where they were held. These are examples of uh, from the superb collection of uh, shields at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, which I urge you to, to go and uh, admire. Uh, this whole uh, military culture uh, is reflected uh, in uh, the monetary system. Uh, this is a, a coin that you have uh, uh, in real size <laughs> on the table. It's very tiny, uh, so you need a magnifying glass. Uh, but this is the, the shield of uh, Charles d'Anjou, uh, king of Hungary and Croatia uh, from uh, 1308. To sum it up, the rituals of war, tournaments, and hunting played a, ma a major role in the success of heraldry. This military origin explains why the arms of many bishops, uh, I don't have time, uh, refer to the military uh, tradition of their family, which may come uh, as a surprise, uh, you know, to think that this, these are the, uh, the, uh, the arms of a, of a bishop, of a church man. It sounds very uh, aggressive <laughs> and warrior-like, but he came from a military family and used the same symbols as the rest of the family. Uh, this military origin also explains why arms still today are still described from the point of view of the bearer of the shield. The viewer's left is actually the right, or dexter, side of the person bearing the arms, and the viewer's right is the bearer's left, or sinister. Care is needed. Uh, for all that, I would say that the origins of heraldry cannot be explained just by the development of military equipment. It is rooted in a new social order that took shape in Western society in the feudal period, explained by new lifestyles and also linked to the development of state bureaucracy. First, let's, let's talk a little bit about the social purpose of heraldry. Like the patronymic names that appeared during the same period as heraldry, since before the 12th century, most individuals were identified only by their first name and didn't have a family name. Coat of arms helped individuals to sign their name. Here you have a beautiful example of a document that hasn't been delivered yet, but I purchased it for the Cornell collection. And there's no signature whatsoever in the document. Uh, the six um, men involved in the contract signed with their seal, with their arms. 
In many legal documents, uh, you find heraldic seals in lieu of signature. Arms helps individuals to situate other individuals and themselves within groups, families, corporations, cities, provinces, nations, that is within a local or large social system as a whole. On top of society, you find the king and the queen whose power comes from God. It took some time for kings and their entourage to develop state ideology and practices. For several centuries, they continued to act in parallel as feudal lords, and heraldry is a symptom of that. In a 1934 great article, Theodor Mommsen, later a professor at Cornell, pointed out that in an effort to distinguish his most important partisans in Italy, Louis II of Bavaria, Holy Roman Emperor since 1322, decided not only to make the famous condottiero mercenary uh, Castuccio Castracani a duke, but also granted him a new coat of arms, allowing him to quarter the Wittelsbach arms, that is the arms of the royal family of Bavaria, with his own. So not the arms of the Holy Roman Empire, but the arms of his clan. And based on that fact, one understands why Dante, in the Divine Comedy, castigated the Ghibellines, and I quote Mommsen, for having degraded the imperial idea to the level of a party label. But in many parts of Europe, the royal arms symbolized the authority of the state. In the 15th and 16th century, you find them more and more on official buildings, in official, uh, so this, these are the arms of uh, Castracani, and you uh, see uh, the change from his previous arms to his arms plus the Wittelbach uh, arms from uh, Bavaria, because, which you know because of Porsche. Um, you find more and more heraldry on uh, objects associated with the authority of the state. And this is a great example, this large oak chest, uh, which was used to collect taxes and payments to the king's army uh, in certain parts of uh, the British Isles. So social purposes, um, administrative uh, use of heraldry. Then I would say, third, there's a practical reason for heraldry. Uh, you uh, can use it as a mark of ownership, made necessary uh, by the spectacular development of furniture and dinnerware, so silverware especially. So you just use heraldry as a mark of ownership so that if the object is stolen, you can recover it more uh, simply. Four, heraldry as a convenient referencing and managing system, which is not something that most people uh, think about and uh, uh, keep in mind. Uh, so this is uh, heraldry as a mark of ownership uh, on a Spanish plate. Uh, heraldry as just a, a mere referencing system. So for instance, uh, <coughs> to organize an apothecary. Huh? You know? So you just uh, see that in this wood engraving, uh, 1515, uh, uh, the image of an apothecary shop, on the drug jars, you see coats of arms indicating just the origin of their content. So instead of writing no powder from uh, uh, Sicily, you put the coat of arms uh, on it. And the same happens uh, in cartography, where instead of having the names of the cities, uh, the ports, then uh, you have a series of uh, uh, coats of arms. Finally, uh, there's another final reason uh, to use heraldry, and that's fiction. By the 13th uh, century, indulgences and the cult of relics had brought increased veneration for the instruments of the passion. These instruments were described in heraldic terms and treated as personal to Christ, much as a coat of arms. You find them in the Nuremberg Chronicle or in, uh, this is number five here, uh, uh, 1520 Missal, where the shield of Christ includes the cross, nails, lance, crown of thorns, sponge with two whips as a crest. Another example is provided by a, a, a very scarce book from our collection. This is uh, arguably the first book ever printed in Mexico uh, by the Spaniards, and it has in it uh, another a shield uh, with the arms, the alleged arms of, of Christ. But it's not just a Christ. A whole range of uh, more or less uh, mythological, fictional uh, uh, characters had their uh, arms. Uh, Chrétien de Troyes blazoned the arms of King Archer, uh, and uh, my good friend uh, Simon Pinet uh, brought my attention to the Libro del Conocimiento de Totos los Reinos, uh, where 
you find a travel book where you find the imaginary arms of fabulous kings such as the Grand Khan or the King of Java. Ah, this is the example of Lancelot, remember the Red Knight. This proliferation of heraldry everywhere in medieval and Renaissance society made it necessary to reg regulate the use of arms and to fix conventions. The guardians of these conventions were the heraldic offices or colleges of arms, primarily registration offices for grants of nobility titles and arms. The English College of Arms, first created by Richard III in 1484, by incorporation of pre-existing chief heralds and pursuivants of arms, or the Spanish Cronista de Armas, founded in the 16th century. Here, uh, you see that the uh, heralds were not forgotten on the facade of the monastery and church San Juan de los Reyes in Toledo, uh, Spain. So you have the gigantic arms inside the church and then outside the church, the heralds who helped with the design of these uh, uh, coats of arms. Why did you uh, need a, a body of you know, professionals, uh, professionals of heraldry? Well, because blazoning a coat of arms is very challenging and very complicated. Uh, another example. And I'm not going to go into too many details because there's Wikipedia for that and you can train online if you want. Uh, the, the language is uh, very specific to heraldry. You have, uh, uh, instead of saying colors, you say metals for uh, or and argent and then tinctures for azure, gules, purple, sable, and vert. Uh, then you have different divisions of the, of the shield, uh, different variation, ge geometric divisions, uh, the ad possible additions of furs. Uh, and then you uh, assemble them together. Um, <clears throat> but at the end, what you get cannot be described like any other image. Another convention is that when you blazon a coat of arms, you must begin by describing the general division of the field. For example, checky, gules, and argent, checkered, red, and white. And then the different visual layers or subfields, beginning with the dexter side, that is uh, the shield bearer's right, but the viewer's left, <laughs> of the cheap upper edge. And it makes it uh, almost uh, impenetrable to, <laughs> uh, to lay people. Uh, what I find very uh, interesting is that uh, to, to reflect on how the world is organized visually, and it, heraldry actually reveals that instead of juxtaposing things, medieval people tended to see the world in terms of visual layers, from the back to the front. How did families, social organizations, painters, cartographers decide to use such and such heraldic colors, tinctures, symbols, divisions, not used yet by others? Sometimes the family arms, that is again, arms passed down through the same family from the 12th century onward, refer to the glorious feast of an ancestor, the killing of a bear, for instance, or the participation in a crusade. Take this book uh, here. When I, I came to Cornell, uh, it didn't say in the online catalog where this book uh, came from, but it's actually rather easy to know about the, the provenance of this uh, book of ours because of the coat of arms here. Uh, it's the coat of arms of the Dien family of Cantal, a very rural part of, of France. Uh, and it's so uh, interesting, uh, I think, uh, because uh, uh, it has uh, in it uh, three crescents, which may refer either to Diane, the goddess of the, of the moon, and that, that would be uh, an example of the survival of the pagan gods, as uh, Sesnek used to to say in a medieval Christian culture, or more likely to the fact that Léon de Dienne, 
The founder of the dynasty participated in the First Crusade and was in Tripoli in uh, 1099. So the crescents are the Islamic uh, crescents reminding people that the founder of the dynasty was involved in the crusade and uh, killed many uh, Arabs. Uh, kings would reward acts of bravery by conferring symbolic arms. An example that still are uh, significant uh, uh, today uh, is the, uh, the story of the uh, Shekeli, an ethnic group uh, in Hungary which uh, derives its name from a Hungarian expression meaning frontier guards. And the Shekeli uh, nation was awarded a collective coat of arms by Emperor Sigismund, who reigned over Hungary be uh, between 1387 and 1437, uh, with the, uh, I don't know if you can really see it, but uh, the sun and the moon. He gave them the sun and the moon. Why? As a token of gratitude for their watching 1724 and securing the border against the Ottomans. And still today, uh, when you go to Budapest, you see the flag of the Shekelis uh, on the facade of the Hungarian parliament. So it really speaks to these people. And uh, I'm not going, of course, to comment on the <laughs> uh, political context you know, with the, the tensions between uh, Christianity uh, or <laughs> Christian Europe and uh, the Muslim world. Other uh, elements uh, could be chosen as an allusion to the family name, and puns are a great source of fun and amusement for us today. Heraldic bearings that represent the bearer's name in the rebus are called canting arms. This is the oldest example uh, known of this uh, guy here, uh, known as uh, Cabrera, which is the goat, and so his old family would adopt the goat as their symbol because they're old goats. Uh, another e <laughs> example is uh, the tomb effigy of Jacques-Léon de Ferrière. Uh, this is a plaque uh, you also see at the Metropolitan Mu Museum uh, in New York. And on his shield here, you see uh, three horse shoes, fer à cheval. So you see the connection between the name and the shield. Even a more famous example, the arms of Albrecht Dürer, the famous artist. Uh, what does it represent? A door. You know how to say a door in German. Tür. Uh, and it's a literal interpretation of the family name, which was taken from his father's birthplace in Hungary, Adios, also meaning door. Dürer is a fantastic for heraldry because he was so fond of uh, arms, he, he kept creating uh, uh, real ones, imaginary ones. Here you have uh, uh, two wonderful examples of Sylvan uh, men and uh, the coat of arms of death. Another example which I cannot uh, develop, uh, you have the, the book uh, on the table, uh, uh, more an example of uh, pedantic scholars uh, <laughs> creating their own symbols during the Renaissance playing with Greek and... Um, within this general frame, there was no limit to invention. Uh, there were fashions and trends in heraldry. Pastoureau has shown that after the lion became the king of animals instead of the bear, more and more important families would want a lion in their arms as opposed to a bear. This is just one example. The, the visual and decorative aspect is very important and I completely agree with uh, Alberto Montaner when he writes uh, that... Uh, we should uh, uh, perhaps keep the right balance between the utilitarian approach and the aesthetic uh, uh, approach. Uh, I didn't mention uh, that other uh, heraldic uh, convention for women. Uh, you know, uh, the, traditionally, the husband's arm would be displayed to the dexter and the wives to the sinister. Uh, it's called impalement. Uh, and you have an example uh, here of Countess Eleanor of Salisbury uh, chained to her husband because she's so dedicated to, to, to him, right? And, uh, and then she, she would uh, change her uh, um, uh, for, for him. Another uh, example, and this is a, a document I, I bought for the Cornell Connections uh, this year in this control of arms uh, uh, with a, a beautiful uh, painting on the cover. Uh, 
1527. So with the arms of the husband and the wife. Uh, uh, the example of a, of a, of a map uh, here. So uh, third and last part. Why does heraldry matter for us today? Uh, first of all, heraldry helps us to identify people in a document. Thus, this is a good example. A heraldic drawing by the officer of arms, Thomas, well, this is a challenging one, Riot Disley, of the, uh, of the deathbed of King Henry VII in uh, 1509. And you see there's absolutely no name on this image, just the coats of arms, but for a uh, professional heraldries that would be transparent and we know exactly who is who. Uh, you've got uh, another uh, example uh, in this uh, Swiss uh, book here where you have the Holy Roman Emperor at the center and then a series of uh, dukes, princes, paying their homage to the emperor and you can identify them only by deciphering their coats of arms. So. It's uh, the first level uh, of, uh, of description. Uh, what you can do with heraldry is identifying uh, people in an image. Uh, you can also tell who owned an object. Uh, and uh, this is something I'm very proud of. Uh, our, our last acquisition uh, uh, to date, I think, uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this is a cutting from, uh, one, uh, from um, one of only two known uh, royal choir books. And uh, this uh, book used to belong to uh, Isabella and Fernando uh, of Spain, uh, the ones who you know, founded uh, the expedition of Christopher Columbus to, to uh, Americas. And it has not only the coat of arms at the center, everything uh, hand-painted, of course, uh, uh, but also uh, the personal symbols of the king and the queen. For the king, it's arrows, because you say flechas in Spanish, so the same initial as in Fernando. And for Isabella, it's yugo, that is the yoke. Again, same initial. And of course, you can see the kind of symbolism that's associated with the, the yoke for the wife and uh, uh, the arrows for, for the man. So that's the, the first uh, use of heraldry uh, to assign an object to someone who commissioned it. An example here of the Baumgartner altarpiece by uh, uh, Dürer. And it's only because of these small armorial shields that we can tell with certainty that these people commissioned the painting. Uh, I found in the History of Science collection uh, a book uh, with the same armorial shield, which means that uh, this book used to belong to the Palmgartner uh, family as well. The second level of description uh, uh, is to uh, the analysis of a social, political, or religious situation. And this is uh, where things get more complicated. So I'm going to wear gloves for, the, uh, for this one because of the sweat and grease that's uh, on my fingers. And we have a, a very spectacular uh, document. Uh, it's called a, a Vidimus. Uh, and we didn't have anything like that in our collection so far. A vidimus is a supplication to the Pope, Innocent VIII in this case, to have an excommunication lifted. A uh, so a certified copy of the original act of excommunicating, made for the purpose of perpetuation when the original decision was in danger of being canceled. So it's a manner of reestablishing uh, the original act. The present uh, supplication uh, was commissioned by the lieutenant to the official of Lyon, France, my home city, on behalf of the Grolet family here, and sent to the Pope here. Uh, 
And uh, the book dealer who uh, sold me uh, this document didn't know why uh, they were excommunicated, but I, th I think I know why. It has to do with uh, uh, ecclesiastical benefits and, <laughs> and so questions of uh, you know, church and money. Um, but an issue going back to the previous generation, 1422, and they had to uh, ask the Pope again to leave the excommunication uh, uh, impacting their uh, parents and uncles, etc. Uh, finally, and uh, this is really my last example, uh, heraldry is uh, important for literary interpretation. Uh, an example here is the Italian poet Il Tasso. When he describes the arms in Segna, in the poem, of the famous female warrior Clorinda in his long epic poem La Gerusalemme Liberata. First edition, uh, uh, 1580. We have uh, only a 1593 edition uh, made in Venice. At some point in the poem, the guerrero is identified by a crest and emerges from the strophe, characterized by an alternation of masculine and feminine rhymes, O and A, as a tigress that only love can tame. And this is, uh, of course, the a Muslim Glorinda. Uh, who fell in love with the uh, Christian uh, uh, knight. A character is inspired by another Amazon, Virgil's Camilla, who wore a tiger skin in the Aeneid of Virgil. So after this talk, I hope you will agree with me that uh, heraldry serves many different uh, purposes and that it's not just for genealogists and snobs. It really matters, and it is a lot of fun indeed. Thank you.